GE Transportation has a long legacy of building quality locomotives, but it's the locomotive modernization program that seems to be all the rave these days. GE has modernized locomotives from the Universal Series, the C Series, the Dash 7 Series, the Dash 8 Series, and the Dash 9 Series all around the world. A rebuilding program for GE locomotives? This may well be a first for NS or anybody else. Almost all of the rebuilding programs which I'm familiar with involved various EMD locomotives or repowering of minority makes, usually Baldwin and Alco. There haven't been many in North America. Numerous experiments and one-offs that didn't extend into a production run like Southern Pacific's two U-25 BEs and then the four Sulter repowered experiments, but there have been two fairly successful programs that do come to mind. The Santa Fe rebuilt 70 U-36Cs and reclassified them as SF-30Cs at Santa Fe's Cleburne shops during 1985 through 1987. And then there's GE Super 7 program, which as I understand it was successful thanks to Mexican customers, although the United States customers didn't seem to embrace it. Only the Monongahela order that Conrail inherited for 17B23-7Rs was it, I believe, for the U.S. orders. And before you accuse me of leaving out the Santa Fe SF-30B number 7200, GE apparently got the message before the Santa Fe went down that road of additional units and contract shops sadly did in the company shops. The loss of self-sufficiency and institutional knowledge didn't help things and technology changed as well. The end result was that it followed somewhat the life of the beep in its later years. The beep which was also referred to as the SWBLW, was an individual switcher locomotive that was built in 1970 by the Santa Fe Railway, again at its Cleburne, Texas workshops. Although technically a rebuild, the Beep, basically a Baldwin Jeep, whose official designation was derived from switcher, Baldwin, locomotive works, the SW coming from the switcher, the B from Baldwin, the L from locomotive, and yes, the W from works, originally entered service on the Santa Fe, as a Baldwin model VO-1000. Following its successful CF7 capital rebuilding program, the company hoped to determine if remanufacturing its aging non-EMD end cab switchers by fitting them with new EMD prime movers was an economically viable proposition. The conversion procedure proved to be too costly and only the one unit was modified. In 2008 through 2009, this locomotive was retired and stored operational at Topeka, Kansas. In May 2009, the unit was donated to the Western America Railroad Museum in Barstow, California. So, the SF-30B stayed one of a kind since the Santa Fe didn't greenlight the rebuilding program after that initial test. And no B-23-7s, which were then relatively young locomotives, including the last examples of the model produced, were planned to be cycled through to the best of my knowledge. The proposal was only for the U-23B fleet only. It seems reasonable, though, that if they were pleased as that fleet aged, something similar may have happened to the B-23-7 fleet to bump up their horsepower to, say, maybe 3,000, modernize them a little bit, and overhaul them. But it wasn't planned as part of the SF-30B program, and it never did occur. The sole four-axle GE rebuild on the Santa Fe was this one prototype rebuild of a U-23B. In addition to being the world leader in locomotive manufacturing, GE Transportation, now Wabtec, is also the world leader in locomotive modernization. And while locomotive modernization has been going on since there were locomotives, the amount being modernized today are the biggest numbers yet. To date, in the United States alone, most of the locomotives out there are modernized versions of the flagship designs from the 1990s, including the Dash 944 CW and the AC 4400 CW. Every railroad has different needs and assets to be modernized and each one identifies a different fleet strategy. Modernized locomotives for the United States market are mainly done to the Dash 9 line of locomotives and newer. Union Pacific's multi-year program which covers 1,000 units will also include several Evolution Series locomotives somewhere down the line. The current focus is on the many AC-44 CW and AC-60 CW locomotives that were built to receive a 6,000 horsepower motor in the 1990s, but due to issues with the motor, were never converted. UP felt that because of their weight and design that their lifespan was not over. And that's the point of this video.
Let's face it, when rail fanning, most of us aren't thinking about the little things that go into diesel locomotive designs such as their weight. Locomotive weight is an all too important factor to consider when design engineers set out to achieve the maximum pulling power possible in an engine. A diesel locomotive's weight is just one of the values that are used to determine the unit's tractive effort. Knowing this, it would be easy to assume that the simple single answer to making any locomotive pull better would just be to add more weight or adhesion to give it more tractive effort, but there's a lot more to consider when increasing either or on a locomotive. If you build a locomotive too light, it'll be less effective at pulling freight. If you build it too heavy, the extra weight could exceed the design parameters of the unit and or reduce the life of it and also other equipment on the ground. A typical 6-axle AC unit weighs between 408,000 and 420,000 pounds, so any additional weight will have to be accounted for in several areas such as the design of the trucks, the type of roller bearings used, and the size of the wheels. When you operate an engine at speeds above roughly 15 miles per hour, the extra weight goes from being an asset to a liability, but still has to be carried which will result in reduced fuel economy and additional wear and tear on the track and bridge structures. With all of that as background, the heaviest locomotives running in North America today are the newest CSX, Norfolk Southern, and Union Pacific General Electric locomotives that tip the scales at a whopping 36 tons per axle. SD40-2s have a minimum continuous speed of about 9 miles per hour and GP40-2s is about 13. Minimum continuous speed is the slowest that a DC locomotive can operate at full power without suffering traction motor damage. Newer locomotives do have backup circuitry to prevent overheating traction motors, but before this, engineers had to make sure that the ammeter wasn't in the red zone for too long. Power is calculated in the amount of amps into the traction motors, although I'm not sure how this was calculated originally. Above 23 miles per hour, the performance curves for the SD40-2s and the GP40-2s are about the same. The extra traction motors allow for a slower minimum continuous speed and greater tractive effort when starting. Otherwise, the other two motors are just extra maintenance and weight, but it will still perform the same. The SD puts out around 80,000 to 90,000 pounds and the Jeep 60,000 pounds at minimum continuous speed. On any given grade, tonnage rating is a function of tractive effort at minimum continuous speed. The Jeep cuts back engine horsepower and thus amps to its traction motors. This protects the Jeep from overload and wheel slip and lets it put its full rating to the train and enables the SD to put out its full rating. If the Jeep is not derated in a multiple unit consist with one or more SDs, then the entire consist must be operated at 13 miles per hour to protect the higher minimum continuous speed units. That is why Mountain Railroad soon figured out that by adding an F9 or F7 or a Jeep 9 or a Jeep 7 to an otherwise 6-axle consist in drag service was a very bad idea, since the tonnage rating of that combination was often less than the three SDs by themselves. Note that some carriers used an F unit, Jeep 9 or a 7 as a separate helper consist. Here, all was well since the 4-axle units were controlled separately from the other 6-axle units. Using all 6-axle locomotives meant a heavier locomotive consist for a given horsepower, which was desirable in drag service, and if the entire fleet was SD, it saved dispatchers and roundhouse foremen from a dose of higher mathematics. If the railroad had a lot of hot traffic and the hot trains were assigned sufficient horsepower to keep above the minimum continuous speed on the upgrade, then four axle power was fine. The implication of that policy was two road locomotive fleets. Most carriers decided that was more trouble than it was worth, which is why the vast majority of road units today are six powered axles. Standardization won the day. So why does Union Pacific only buy AC locomotives when DC locomotives will work fine on non-unit trains? Same for the CSX. And why did the BNSF switch to four motor AC versus six motor DC? And what are the financial incentives? It's the service requirements and line profile that determine what locomotive fits best. First, you figure out what horsepower per ton you need to get from point A to point B in the time required. Then you figure out how much maximum tractive effort you need to get up and over the ruling grade without stalling. You can do this for each line and class of service. Then you have to look at the trade-offs between having segregated fleets versus a universal fleet. If you have widely disparate requirements and there exist advantages for buying a disparate fleet to meet those needs, then a segregated fleet might make sense. 
UP pretty much gave up dispatching by horsepower per ton and power everything at drag ratings. The Bensef has not done this. That's why the Bensef is buying four motor locomotives and Union Pacific is not. When a four axle unit is operating at full horsepower in the higher speed range, the equivalent six axle locomotive becomes a liability at speed. At 12 miles per hour, the SD40-2 will be producing around 75,000 pounds of tractive effort and the Jeep will be producing around 50,000 pounds. Above 23 miles per hour, the performance curves for the SD40-2s and GP40-2s are about the same. As far as traction motor life goes, a lot of it's road dependent. The western roads with their long hard climbs over the continental divide or a preponderance of coal trains had the shortest lifespans. Flatland roads like the Rock Island or the Chicago Northwestern had a longer life. Conrail was doing about double the life of the Burlington Northern in the early 1990s. For example, the average life range was something like two to six years per traction motor. An SD40-2 that was coming in for a five to six year overhaul would typically only have one or two of its original traction motors still in it. Four axle locomotives that were used in yard and local service fared much better. The failure rates for those were very, very low. From a cost perspective, there's no point to spend the money going through the DC to AC rebuild if there's no performance gain, but performance is only part of the equation. Cost to own and maintain is a big chunk too. Way back when, when AC units were first being thought about, it was estimated that about half the benefit was performance, that's the reduction in number of units, and the other half was maintenance cost. The inverter plus the AC motors was greater than the DC motors. DC motors were and remain the 900 pound gorilla of locomotive maintenance cost. Traction motor maintenance ranged from roughly one third of total locomotive maintenance cost to 60% in the early 1990s. I imagine the prevalence of thermal overload protection has helped the cause of the DC motor some, but I wouldn't be surprised if the overall failure rate changes a lot over the years. In fact, the trend toward lower horsepower per ton a la one E. Hunter Harrison has probably made things a lot worse. A little known fact, the NS had tested the ES44 C4s but never went back, which would suggest that the hilly profile of the Norfolk Southern Network is not suitable for a locomotive with unpowered axles. That's saying something from both sides of the spectrum as NS generally has much tamer ruling mainline grades than the CSX, the UP, and the Bensef who seems to be in love with the C4s. Thinking about this a little bit more, one reason that might have been why they didn't go with the four motor upgrades is that it would also require the new bogies. The A1A bogey has that lifter on the idler axle. A straight six motor conversion does not so you don't have to add the lifter. When the NS purchased their AC locomotives they did so mainly for unit train service, most notably Pokey Coal. Dash 9s are a good fit for the NS's main lines and primary branches outside of unit train service. I briefly touched on this concept in the last EMD vs GE video, the SD70ACE vs the ES44AC at the top of that video. And here's a snippet from the top of that video. The Piedmont division on the NS between Atlanta and Washington DC has some of the best track on the railroad. It used to be a mecca for passenger trains before the Hartsfield Jackson Airport opened near Atlanta. It's double tracked for the most part and there are many sections that allow for 60 mile per hour running. I'm told that the preference for intermodals are the SD70 ACEs, the M-2s, the ES44 ACs, and the ES44 DCs. Nowadays, NS tries to fill its secondary assignments with older powers such as SD40-2s, or at least they did until the SD60Es pushed many of the legendary EMDs out to pasture. In business, which includes railroading, there are no acceptable or unacceptable failure rates, just rates that are better and worse. SD40-2s were acceptable locomotives, and they still are, yet they were replaced by the SD70 Max on Burlington Northern coal trains. It all just boils down to economics. Performance reasons are why the ACs took over the Powder River Basin coal trains and such. They offered unit reduction over the SD40-2s and the C30-7s due to their greater horsepower and the adhesion benefits of AC traction, lower fuel cost, and etc. In every way, they were far more efficient and offered a significant savings for the Burlington Northern and then Bensef when they got rid of the last of the DC power when they moved the SD60s out. 